Hello, Asian patrons of the Vatican Museums. I'm Liz Lev, and this is the first of a four-part series on the world of Raphael, sponsored by Ben Chang and the Singapore chapter of the Asian Patrons of the Vatican Museums. And we'll be telling in these four episodes the life of the painter Raphael Sanzio on the 500th anniversary of his death. So this one starts, the, our first episode starts really in the middle of what catapulted Raphael to fame. You'll see in our last segments how Raphael was a very young man traveling around Italy, building up a reputation as a painter. But in 1509, he arrived in Rome. And in Rome, there was already the majestic presence of Michelangelo, breaking new artistic ground in the Sistine Chapel. So as Raphael came along, Raphael, who was really destined to be the heir to Leonardo da Vinci as the greatest living painter, found himself in the arena with Michelangelo. We let the games begin. So this takes place with the backdrop of the city of Rome, a Rome in 1500, which was very busy. It had spent the first half of the 15th century basically a backwater, but in the past 25 years, Rome had become a very busy, industrialized urban center with new buildings going up every few minutes. And so Raphael came probably somewhere around 1508 to 1509, where Michelangelo had already been in the city for three years. And this city, fittingly, the city that once contained the great Colosseum for the games, uh, this would be the setting for Raphael and Michelangelo's great showdown. Now, this is certainly not an event that's going to take place in the Roman arena. This is actually coordinated by another person, one of the greatest patrons of all time, the patron who started the Vatican Museums, Pope Julius II. You see his portrait here, a man whose will, uh, wealth, and wit was able to put together in the same space two of the greatest artists in the world and bring out their best. An investment, if you will, which we still reap today at the Vatican Museums. So Julius II is worth a moment or two of uh, thinking about. The man who arranged this was the nephew of a pope. His uncle was Pope Sixtus IV. And in this painting, which is contained in the Vatican Museums, you see Sixtus IV sitting on the right, opening Vatican Library 1475, and in front of him, standing in red in a very important looking position, is his nephew, the future Pope Julius II. Sixtus IV was a pope that's very, very important for art. He was the pope who opened the world's first public museum since the time of antiquity. And the way he did it was in 1471 when he was elected, he took five bronze statues that had been kept at the Cathedral of Rome, St. John Lateran, from time immemorial. And instead of leaving them in the private space of the papacy, he put them out in public on the Capitoline Hill and he opened the Capitoline Museums. One of my favorite sentences in all of the history of art is that the first public museum since the age of antiquity was opened by a pope. And not only did he, uh, not only did he uh, give these statues, he commissioned new statues. So this famous she-wolf you see in front of you, which is perhaps a 6th century BC bronze statue, Sixtus was the one who commissioned the two baby statues underneath it, most likely by Polaiolo, creating what is to this very day the symbol of the city of Rome. Sixtus IV had also built the Sistine Chapel, which of course is going to be one of the great arenas of this battle between Michelangelo and Raphael. He had had it built in 1477 as a great chapel reserved for the papal court. And when you look around the side walls, you see a series of paintings commissioned by Sixtus IV. So Sixtus IV built a chapel and planned to have it decorated with false painted drapery on the lower level, followed by a series of panel paintings to show the life of Jesus and the life of Moses so that they would parallel each other. And in the typical way that one decorated ceilings in the 15th century, he had the ceiling as a blue sky with stars. 
Now, what makes Sixtus interesting is that to decorate his side walls, he chose not to have just one person work on it. He chose to have a team of painters. So he brought down to Rome men like Perugino, Luca Signorelli, who would do the famous San Brizio Chapel in Orvieto. He brought down Ghirlandaio, Michelangelo's old painting teacher, and he brought Sandro Botticelli, who's an incredibly famous artist in 1480. Sandro Botticelli did three of the paintings in the chapel, and in this one that was placed directly across from where the Pope was sitting, you could see A, his pet project, which is the Church of Santo Spirito. It's actually a hospital church of Santo Spirito in front, directly in front of you. And in the corner, who is there supervising this team of painters? But Giuliano della Rovere, portrayed by Sandro Botticelli. So this man is so hooked in with art. He has his portrait done by Melozzo da Forlì, his portrait done by Botticelli. He's in charge of supervising the team of Perugino, Luca Signorelli, Ghirlandaio. This man is hooked into art by the time he became Pope Julius II, elected on November 1st, 1503. He brought with him a rather surprising dowry. He brought with him a very interesting uh, series of things to his bags to the Vatican. Julius had already made a name for himself as a collector of ancient statuary. He was um, uh, perfectly capable of, of choosing very beautiful works of art. And the pride of his collection was the Apollo, which you see there on the left, a classical statue of, of second century AD copy of a fourth century BC original. And over the course of the years, Julius would collect more statues, including the extraordinarily beautiful Cleopatra and the groundbreaking, truly influential Laocoon. So, but when Julius was elected, he was sitting on already a personal collection of extraordinary statuary, which in any other circumstances would have been handed over to a family member. The custom was a great work of art, if you have a great collection, you give them to a member of your family. But Julius chose to arrange them inside the Belvedere courtyard. Inside the courtyard that had just been designed in his brand new uh, palace, this brand new palace, which was meant to be a recreational palace, he decided to put them out so that the artists, the humanists, the poets, the writers, they would be able to be inspired by these works. So Julius opened not so much a public museum, but more of a private atelier inside the Vatican, putting these sculptures at the disposal of people who would know how to use them, people who would know how to draw from them. And that was the origin of the Vatican museums. To put his museums, to, 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 to put his sculptures, he chose a pleasure palace, which had just been built. It was built in 1486, two years after the death of Sixtus IV under Innocent VIII, and it sat on the top of the Vatican Hill. A small, lonely little palace with large loggia that had views over the city and over the countryside, for that reason known as the Palazzetto Belvedere. It had an interior garden, and that was the place that Julius chose to put the statues. So it went from being a private place for the Pope alone to go pray, play a breviary, to be the place where artists would be able to join. And then, in order to connect that space more completely to the buildings where the Pope actually lived and worked, those buildings that were being decorated with what was then the contemporary art of Michelangelo and Raphael, he wanted to make a link between past and present. And so he called on his, his, his very, very gifted architect, Donato Bramante, to build what is known as the, as the Bramante Courtyard from the Belvedere Palace at the top of the hill through a series of levels and a series of arcades. We could, the, he connected the building at the top of the hill to the palace in the Sistine Chapel at the bottom of the hill in one beautiful seamless effect. And that Belvedere Courtyard is the nucleus of the Vatican Museum. It is the heart of the Vatican Museums. It is the place where we would have seen Michelangelo, Raphael, Leonardo da Vinci lived in the Belvedere Palace from 1513 to 1516, this incredible space all brought together by Donato Bramante. 
Now that courtyard had fallen into terrible disrepair. It actually inexpensively painted in the recent years with this dreadful sort of orangey paint, part of it just sort of crumbling. This great cradle of the, of the high Renaissance in Rome had fallen into pieces until you patrons began the work of its its restoration and you'll find there is a little film attached in the in the video not in this video but it's in the site there's a little film attached that will tell you the wonderful story of how close this belvedere courtyard is to completion along with a little surprise they found while they were cleaning it but moving back to our pope julius ii we see a man who is a little bit different from the papacy we understand today. The papacy today is really a spiritual role. The Pope is the head of the smallest country in the world, Vatican City State, is 104 acres, a quarter square mile. But his spiritual authority extends all over. Now, as it just so happens, Julius II's temporal authority extended far further than the Vatican walls. At the time Julius was elected, the Papal States ran from, you can see it on the map on the right in blue, they ran from the Adriatic to the Mediterranean, north of Naples, south of Florence. All of this belonged to the Pope. And something else that's very pertinent about the role of Julius II is that the Protestant Reformation doesn't happen until 1517. Julius II died in 1513, and four years later, the Reformation started. That means Julius was the head of all of Christendom. There were no Protestants yet. And so it gave him a spiritual authority, a spiritual power over people that was really quite extraordinary. So the decoration and the space for this Pope had to be very, very meaningful. Julius II was elected in the shortest conclave in history, and he was elected by a unanimous vote. It turns out his predecessor, Alexander VI Borgia, was not really what you would describe as one of our better popes. And after an 11-year pontificate of so much difficulty, the cardinals said to Julius, we would like you to be pope, but we need you to reform this church. So one of the first things Julius did is he went to go see the apartments of Alexander VI Borgia. The expectation was he would just move in where the old pope was. And while these apartments are extremely beautiful, they were painted by Bernardino Pinturicchio in 1492, they use extremely expensive materials. The restorations have found that the gold you see on the ceiling is actually some of the first gold of the new world. The blue is a lapis lazuli, comes from Afghanistan, extremely expensive. There are pictures that are awkward for the papacy, the numerous children of, of Pope Alexander VI, as well as a few esoteric Egyptian myths that perhaps are not appropriate on the walls of the Vicar of Christ. And so Julius made an interesting decision. He would move out of those apartments and move into a brand new set of apartments to be constructed by Bramante. And when it was time, when the apartments were ready, Julius then had to decide on the painter decorator and who he has in his contacts list, the greatest living painters of the late 15th century. So he chose Pietro Perugino and the choice of Pietro Perugino tells you a lot. Look at those big open spaces in the delivery of the keys. So you have this incredibly vast amount of open space that allows you to breathe. There's a cleanness in this painting, the, the translucent blue of the air. There's also a pristine element, those crisp images of the baptistry, a symbol of renewal, the triumphal arches, symbols of victory, and the way each figure is placed neatly into his scheme. There's an austerity, a clarity, and a kind of quiet, dignified beauty about Perugino, and that is what Julius went for. The only thing is that Bramante brought his um, young nephew along to meet the Pope. And even though Perugino had begun the work of the papal apartments, this is a sort of a mock-up of what they might have looked like, uh, you would see just a bunch of these paintings, since they're stories of virtues, uh, uh, surrounded the room. Bramante brought his young nephew, Raphael, to meet Pope Julius II. 
And after Julius spoke to the young man for a while, the Pope had all the works in progress destroyed. According to Vasari, Julius was persuaded to demolish all the scenes that were painted by other artists, both old and new, so that Raphael alone might be honored before all those who had labored there previously. The 25-year-old Raphael pulled the rug out from all the other more famous established painters and walked into the papal apartments to start painting in the Pope's throne room. So he would be painting just a stone's throw from where Michelangelo was. Michelangelo was in the Sistine Chapel and a few feet away was Raphael painting the Pope's apartments. Michelangelo painting the place where he was elected successor of, of, of St. Peter and he was in, in Raphael painting in the space where the Pope shows himself as a head of state who wields considerable authority. Both of these places are extremely significant and important. And you can see all the way back on the opposite side of the complex, there is the Belvedere Courtyard uh, before its restoration. They just started over there in the corner. Raphael started not in a broom closet, not doing some little side room that nobody would notice if he made a mistake. Raphael's work started in what is known as the Stanza della Segnatura. And this is the throne room of the Pope. This is where the Pope met people. And so it is a high stakes thing for the 25 year old to come in, paint the cornice for one of the most powerful men in the world, all the while with Michelangelo a few feet away, working in the Sistine Chapel behind closed doors. He wouldn't allow anyone in to sort of inspect the work or add commentary. Only Julius and a small group of people were allowed in and out to see what was happening in the Sistine Chapel. The complexity of the program, we're going to be making a framework for this very, very important and powerful person whose power rests on two pillars, temporal and spiritual, was beyond 25-year-old Raphael's abilities. And so he was assigned uh, a, a kind of script writer. Uh, Tommaso Ingirami was the man who worked out the ideas that inspired Raphael to paint such extraordinarily beautiful paintings. And the, the room was dedicated to wisdom. Ingirami was thinking, if you have a person who is that powerful? What is the quality you're hoping, hoping to find? Someone who has to run a country and get souls into heaven. And he thought wisdom. And so those stars of David you see in the beautiful Cosmotesque floor, it's the swan song of the Cosmotesque here. The stars of David are a symbol of wisdom. In the ceiling, we have the abstracted ideas of knowledge, the inspiration that draws us towards philosophy, that draws us towards theology, that draws us towards the arts. But in the corner over the Pope's right shoulder was the image of the judgment of Solomon. Solomon, the king of Israel, who when God asked him what out, offered him anything he wanted, he asked for he asked for the ability to know right from wrong. So this became a room about two types of knowledge, about knowing about, uh, knowing about the knowledge that is infused into you, and then around the room we will see the liberal arts and sciences. The Pope himself was framed by the image of law. So he sat in a red velvet throne between those two windows. To his left was Justinian, the Roman emperor who compiled all Roman law from 500 BC to 500 AD. And to his right is Gregory the Ninth, who was receiving the decretals, which will become canon law. And so you have a Pope who frames himself between the law of the land and the law of the church, again, drawing out that dual nature of the papacy between temporal ruler and spiritual leader. Above his head, you see three virtues. These are cardinal virtues, which are very much essential for a good ruler, fortitude, prudence, and temperance. And above the Pope's head was the image of justice, the Pope showing himself as this personification of justice. Then we move to the right of the Pope and we see the image known as the disputation or the disputa in Italian. It represents essentially theology. And on the lower part of the painting, you see uh, the, the church militant. And on the upper part of the painting, you see the church triumphant. The church militant drawn from many figures that Raphael had seen from studying the work of Leonardo da Vinci is emotion, drawing your eye, 
constantly towards the center where the core of the painting is occupied by the consecrated host in the monstrance and then your eye goes up to the holy spirit Christ and God the Father. The upper part of the painting is still, as opposed to the church militant, which is the church which is in motion, the church triumphant, which you see in the upper part with the apostles and the prophets seated side by side, is the mystical body of Christ, perfect and eternal. Next to it, and directly across from the Pope's mm, throne, was the image of Parnassus. And in the history of art, these, this work always seems to get a little sidelined. For me, this work is tremendously important because it reveals something about the character of Julius II, the great patron. Now, because Julius II was very adamant about invasions of church territory, he had been known to lead armies himself to expel people from the papal territories, the, the soil of the papal territories. And for that reason, he was given the earned nickname, the Warrior Pope. The nickname stuck, and 500 years later, if you sort of casually get involved in studying the work of Julius II, you'll find out Julius II, the warrior pope, which gives us the impression of some big thug who happened to get Michelangelo and Raphael by accident to somehow work for him, which is a very mistaken impression. Julius II sat across from this painting, which shows Mount Parnassus, which in Greek mythology is the mountain where the muses live. So if Mount Olympus is where the gods live, the muses live on Mount Parnassus. They are governed by Apollo. Apollo is the king of the muses, his music, light, poetry, everything that really makes up what we would consider a civilization. So at the top of Mount Parnassus, Raphael painted Apollo and the nine muses, and then tumbling down the left and the right, we have the great poets of all time. This will become a little clearer when you see some of the later lectures that one of the major tensions that is happening between Michelangelo and Raphael is that each one wants to enter into the golden circle of what they call the liberal arts. Painting and sculpture in 1508 were both considered crafts. That means an art form that you use your hands more than your mind. The liberal arts, mathematics, astronomy, uh, architecture, and poetry which you see here, that is an art that requires the use of the mind first and the use of the hand secondary. And Raphael and Michelangelo in this great clash of the Titans are each trying to claim a place for his respective art among the liberal arts. So Raphael shows us poetry, which by its nature is the closest to painting. And so if you're painting pictures with words in poetry, in paintings, you're creating poetry in images, is the, is the mentality which goes all the way back to ancient Greece. At the top of the mountain, we see the great poets of all time, and then we have more contemporary and lighter poets. But to bring this back to Julius II, the label I put underneath is covering a window. And where Julius sat in his desk, this is the painting that framed him. Through the window, you could look all the way up the courtyard to the Belvedere Palace, and the Belvedere Palace is where Julius gave his very own personal statue of Apollo, placed it in a garden on the top of a hill, and then brought a bunch of artists together to learn from him. Julius sees himself as a kind of new Apollo, trying to bring about a golden age in art, not a pagan golden age. He wants to create the golden age of art in Christendom, which I think we can all say he was fairly successful at. And so in his painting, he shows us how important antiquity is to his contemporary scheme. There's, there's Homer, Homer with, who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, without whom we would not have Virgil's Aeneid, the story of the, the fall of Troy and the foundation of Rome. And without the Aeneid, we wouldn't have Dante's Divine Comedy, the extraordinarily beautiful Christian poem that has influenced authors for centuries. And so there is a divine lineage in the arts, proclaims Julius, starting with Homer, who gave us the Divine Comedy, and the ancient sculptures that Julius puts in that will give us the works we're looking at today. So what I'm trying to say, I think, about Julius II is that he was the kind of man who believed beauty would save the world, and he then he put his money where his mouth was. 
Of course, the most famous poem painting in the room is the painting of philosophy, otherwise known as the School of Athens. Painted around 1510 by Raphael, it shows uh, the two great philosophers, the fathers of the fathers of thought, who are seated or standing underneath that triple arch. One two, three beautiful arches draw our eye downward and we look at Plato, the older man, indicating upwards to represent abstract thought. And then we see Aristotle reaching forward to represent the natural sciences, the physical sciences. The painting then subdivides so that you have the upper level figures who are abstract thinkers. Socrates is wearing an olive robe. He's talking to Alexander the Great or Alcibiades, nobody's really sure. Xenophon over on the other side. And then you have the eye moving downwards to join or to look at these schools of thought, these little groups that are standing around a teacher. So on the right, you have Euclid with his adoring students. And on the left, you have Pythagoras with his students. And on the far right, you can glimpse a sort of graduate class taking place. Two men holding globes. The man with the crown is Ptolemy. The man in back of him is Strabo. And then we'll have little Raphael pointing, looking in from that group. Raphael entering among the liberal artists. So again, a lot of the backdrop of the story between Michelangelo and Raphael is this battle to be recognized as a liberal art. Now, these two paintings stand across from each other in the Stanza della Segnatura. It has been my experience over the years to notice that most people walk in, they look at the lower right-hand painting, the one known as the School of Athens, and that seems to be their takeaway from the Renaissance from this painting, that the Renaissance, the work of Raphael, the reason why he's so successful is because of the fact that he employs these pagan motifs and these pagan thoughts in this Renaissance, which brings back the pagan world. That is a half correct statement. The reason why Raphael is so invaluable to Julius II is because in putting the painting of theology and philosophy across from each other so that they stand on opposite sides of the room, in putting the paintings of, of theology and philosophy across from each other, Raphael allowed them to speak to each other. These paintings have a conversation about the nature of philosophy and the nature of theology, a conversation that in the words of the man who designed the program, Tommaso Ingirami, would probably be better expressed as a conversation between faith and reason. And the best part of this conversation is that Raphael was a 25 year old kid who had barely finished elementary school. Therefore, we're not looking at complicated texts and dead languages that we have to dig up. Raphael is a painter. In 1500, to be a painter means you arrange figures in space in a meaningful way. And so in the painting of theology, the principal line is up and down. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the host, the vertical line that governs theology. Horizontality governs philosophy with a figure that runs in from the left and runs out from the right, the imagery being these currents of thought, and that philosophy is meant for us to understand the world around us, not the eternal, invisible world. Then this amazing image shows the painting of the philosophy with no people in it. And look at that framework that Raphael puts together. He is a master of perspective. These beautiful coffers that are, are reducing in space, the organization so that every single figure will have a space in which he or she, he, he will stand. And so he creates a very strong architectural framework for this, which is actually a wonderful metaphor for philosophy. Philosophy is our way of dominating and organizing our body of knowledge, and this and 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 architecture is our way of dominating and organizing our body of space. On the other hand, the painting of theology for a town that has six three hundred and sixty churches, oddly enough, is a uh, very little architecture, and indeed, all the lines that create the perspective in this painting draw your eye 
to the host. So we're not looking at a physical structure of a church. All your eye, all your, all the lines draw your eye to see the consecrated host on the altar. And then behind the host, you see this infinite space, this reminder that you will never know more about God than God does. But looking deeply, deeply, deeply in the distance, you may one day indeed see the light. The genius of Raphael's painting, however, has more to do with the way he orchestrated the figures. And these are all very valuable lessons that he is deriving from Leonardo da Vinci. So when he has to move 60 figures through this painting, I and mean, people have been adding more and more and more figures to their paintings as a way of showing a capacity to choreograph large scale chorus scenes, basically, in their paintings. And the fact of the matter is that Raphael has to move 60 different figures, but he doesn't want to line them up as if it were a company photograph at a corporate picnic. He's trying to move the figures so your eye has to move through the space. And for this, he needs the art of Leonardo. So you have a first figure who's leaning out towards the left. And he's pointing to his book and he's basically saying, don't pay attention to that, read my book. Then a man looks at the book but with his hand points towards the young man in the yellow and the blue, who is the Pope's nephew, so you probably want to be nice to him. That young man points towards three kneeling men. And as we will see in our elusive Leonardo lecture, as we will see, those three young men come from Leonardo da Vinci's uh, Adoration of the Magi, the figure with its back to you, and then you have three hands straight from Leonardo's Last Supper, leading, leading you to the man on the other side who is pointing upwards. The same thing happens on the opposite side, starting with the two figures on the right that are a little bit more boldly drawn. They're a little bit more muscular. And this brings in just a little rumor uh, that circulates, uh, started by Vasari, who again is Michelangelo's contemporary. Vasari says that Bramante had the keys to everything in the Vatican, and that young Raphael knew that something was up with the Sistine Chapel ceiling, and that Bramante got Raphael in to be able to see Michelangelo's work before it was unveiled. And so these two figures who are inexplicably muscular, who jut out into space in a far more aggressive fashion, are believed to be the fruit of Raphael's early bird study of Michelangelo's work in the Sistine Chapel. The philosophy painting, on the other hand, draws your eye downwards. You have one, two, three arches, and the final arch frames Plato and Aristotle the exact same way that the rectangular window at the back of Jesus in Leonardo's Last Supper isolates and frames Jesus so we understand he is the origin of everything that happens in the painting. In this work, the frame behind Plato and Aristotle make us understand that they are the origin of rational thought. They are dropped into the scene like a stone dropped into still water. You can feel them plunk down and then the water which seems to spread. The figures, they, they move out like splashes of water. So you have the first group on the left and this time the motion comes down and it groups into these schools of thought, the teachers with these students around the middle. There's several rather famous portraits in here. We have Raphael, who you can see a little better, second figure in from the right with the black hat looking at you. Uh, we have over here this lovely image of um, Pythagoras and the recognition of the role of the Arab world in bringing that knowledge to the West, that figure with the turban probably someone like Al-Hazan, the Arab philosopher who is instrumental to bringing this kind of uh, scientific knowledge through the school of Cordoba in Spain into the Western world. This took place in the 12th century. Here we have Diogenes the Cynic. He's a funny one. Uh, the Renaissance has a certain uh, admiration, a grudging admiration for him. He was unpresentable in many ways, but he also had an untiring and uncompromising search for the truth. So they put him in the middle because he's not really a philosopher, not a natural philosopher, nor is he an abstract philosopher. And then over here on the left is a little shout out to Tommaso Ingirami, represented here as Epicure, because beyond being a very wise and brilliant man, he apparently was very fond of his food and drink. But as Raphael finished this work, and the applause, of course, went wild, 
Uh, at the exact same time, Michelangelo finished the first half of the Sistine Chapel. And Julius II, who knew how to make the best of a good situation, insisted Michelangelo unveil the first half of the chapel. So just as Raphael unveils this incredible achievement of the 60 figures moving through space and everybody is awestruck, applause, uh, shouts of joy, Michelangelo opens the first half of the Sistine Chapel, the entire papal court and anybody who was in the vicinity came trudging down to Rome for the six weeks, six, six, six weeks it was open, looked up at the ceiling, jaws dropped because Michelangelo had done something that was considered impossible. In many ways, swept away the, the momentum of the fame for Raphael, drawing it into the Sistine Chapel as people realized for the very first time, an artist had succeeded in painting stories on a ceiling. And the way he did this, the way he executed the Sistine Chapel ceiling was due to the fact that he was a sculptor. It was very clear in every frame of this chapel that a man who had been trained, trained as a painter all his life would not have been able to execute what we see in the ceiling. The painted marble framework, someone who was thinking in terms of how architecture and sculpture go together, he creates a painted marble framework, and then in the middle of it, he places these sculptural figures, figures that are three-dimensional. They're placed against a blank background. The whole point of Renaissance art is creating spaces for these figures. You make three-dimensional spaces with perspective. You put in nature, you put in household goods, you put in whatever you have to in order to create a convincing set. Michelangelo dispenses with all that because he is spent his entire life since he was 15 years old looking at a piece of stone and removing the figure he sees within with a hammer and chisel. And that mentality appears on the screen. Adam portrayed against a blank background. So all we have to understand first man is the body. A body that Michelangelo made a lifetime study of doing dissections while he was up in Florence. We see an immediate impression of the heaviness of the leg and the heaviness of the arm that sits on the knee. Our first impression of an inert body. But then Michelangelo adds to it the bent knee the strong flexed shoulders that give us a, a sense of a contained potential energy and that dichotomy of the exterior heavy, almost lazy limbs versus the tight, uh, ready, uh, poised limbs uh, with that compressed kinetic energy and the beautiful effect that Michelangelo is expert at of the moment before God activates that energy, God moving towards Adam in this full on contrast to the heaviness of Adam, the dynamism of God, two fundamental bodies to talk about what it means to awaken man to his destiny, and then two extra bodies of, 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 of Eve and then the, 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 pre, the premonition of the child Jesus in order to tell the rest of the story. Michelangelo had broken absolute new ground. Art would never be the same, and there was no point in Raphael pretending that this wasn't happening. So Raphael got ready to enter the next room he was going to work on in order to answer and to face the challenge laid down by Michelangelo. But before he did, he did add, he did add one more almost funny little Sally, where in his image for the School of Athens, we can see the preparatory drawing, you can see the schools of, of, uh, of artists on the left and on the right, and you can see that you can see Diogenes the Cynic, but here at the bottom of the stairs, there is nobody there. Raphael went back and he added the portrait of Michelangelo. So in that painting of the School of Athens, we have on the right the portrait of Raphael, and we have on the left the portrait of Michelangelo. So on one hand, you might think, well, that's great. Raphael put in the portrait. They wanted to be friends. He's recognizing the genius of Michelangelo. And, and I know there are many people who feel that way, art historians who have spent even more years than I have studying this stuff. But I always run into one little question about this, 
if Michelangelo was going to be allowed to join this group picture, how come nobody told him that the dress code was business casual? Because Michelangelo appears in this picture wearing a smock and boots, which he uses to chop marble. That's the costume, the outfit. It's like a garage mechanics outfit. And of course, he's leaning up against a block of marble as a reminder that his guild is the stonemason's guild. So I personally look at this as a bit of a backhanded compliment more than anything else. But that doesn't mean Raphael wasn't ready to handle the challenge. From here on in, ceilings would have to be painted. And for those of you who have come to Rome and looked at those beautiful ceilings with those flying angels all over the place, that is the legacy of Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. But Raphael began by making these bolder figures against blanker backgrounds, understanding that this was the technique of the ceiling painting. But then he went to take Michelangelo's sculptural figures out for a test drive. And in the room called the Room of Heliodorus, the Stanza, the Stanza de Eliodoro, he shows you a way, he shows you how he responds to Michelangelo's painting. And in many ways, not only does he ante up to Michelangelo's work, but he also raises one. And so the first painting, actually, the room takes its name from this painting, where Raphael engages Michelangelo's art. It's the, uh, the stories from the second book of Maccabees, when Heliodorus was sent by the king of Syria to steal the treasure from the temple, which is just the savings of the widows and the orphans. The painting starts on the left-hand side with a group of female figures, the widows and the orphans, beautifully blended in a way that we'll see Raphael does a lot of Madonna and Child, and he's very, very good at grouping these figures together. In the foreground on the left, you have Pope Julius II and Raphael, who has just been promoted to chair bearer, who are coming in to witness the miracle, which of course, took place 2,000 years before Raphael was born, but you know, if you pay for it, I guess you get to be in it. And then the fig, then the story begins. Um, the 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 Heliodorus comes to take the treasure from the temple. One of the women in that group, she's much more dramatically drawn. The painting color, it's much more metallic. It's actually very similar to the type of technique Michelangelo is using in the Sistine Chapel. The dramatic turn in space, it's almost like this. The figure that Raphael paints is the figure of the, of the Delphic Sibyl from the back. The colors are sharp, hard, metallic as they turn in space. And she draws your eye to the priest at the high altar. The priest is praying for a miracle. Nothing happens until Heliodorus is taking the treasure. A celestial horseman knocks him down and two divine young men come up and scourge him five sculptural figures moving your eye across the lunette as if you were turning the pages of a book. Now, kneeling on the lower part here, lying on the lower part here, we see this very dramatic body reclining. And of course, the new potential of reclining bodies is being made evident by Michelangelo's uh, creation, Adam and the creation of man. But the real answer that Raphael gave when I say he raised Michelangelo, it's in this painting called The Liberation of St. Peter. In this painting, Raphael shows his capacity to manipulate light. So where Michelangelo as a sculptor spent his youthful years, his formative years, learning how to carve marble, Raphael's basic technique, and this is actually written in Leonardo da Vinci's treatise on painting, the basic technique he's using is called chiaro scuro. It's called chiaro light scuro shade, and it alludes to the use of light and shade to make a three-dimensional image on a two-dimensional surface. So this is how you make something look like it's projecting towards you. Raphael in this painting uses chiaroscuro for a different purpose. The light that is emanated by that angel is incredibly powerful. It's so powerful that it's more, it's, it dominates the angel. The angel itself doesn't look particularly muscular. So when St. Peter's put in prison and he's freed, by an angel. This is in the Acts of the Apostles. The angel doesn't seem to have any physical power. And I always think to myself, you know, if Michelangelo had been doing the same subject, we'd have a bare-chested angel muscling up to the bars. But Raphael doesn't want to show you the angel's physical power. The angel is there as a messenger. He wants to give you supernatural power. And so how does he do it? 
this brand new use of light, a light that is so powerful, it seems to fill the space. It seems to strain against the great. It's that heavenly light that he brings with him that is going to free Peter. Whereas on the left-hand side, Raphael then gave you three examples of natural light. So you see the yellow light from the flickering torch, you see the pinky light of dawn, and you see silvery moonlight. Three types of natural light, one type of supernatural light. Raphael just painted circles around Michelangelo. You could have locked Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel for 10 years, and he would not have been able to do this work because it's so based on the art of painting, drawn in and formed from childhood. While Raphael was working on this project, he met another painter. He had a little possibility to go uh, do some work between the first room and the second room for another patron. And while he was there, he met a, a Venetian painter named Sebastiano del Piombo. And Venetians paint differently from Florentines and Romans. They use oil paint. And oil paint is a game changer in the history of art for many, many reasons. But one of the immediate effects is that oil paint has softer colors, greater possibility of blending. And in oil paint, you're able to get out textures in a much more potent way. And so Raphael, during this little hiatus uh, in 1514, learned how to oil paint. And when you see the result in the same room, so we're still in the room of Heliodorus, after he did Heliodorus, he showed basically what I did on my summer vacation. I learned how to oil paint. And here is the pre-restored miracle of Bolsena. And I wanted to just, I've, I've, I've been making a point in these lectures. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm so happy to be able to work on this project with the patrons is because my entire life as an art historian has been marked by the work of the patrons. I studied, started studying art about 35 years ago, which is right about the time that the patrons were formed. And all my life as I was studying from my dirty, horrible books with these dreadful dark pictures and thinking to myself, boy, I don't really know if I chose the right field. All the, right, all the time, things have been cleaned and cleaned and cleaned, and nowhere have they been cleaned more rapidly, more beautifully, more effectively, more correctly, and more um, honestly than in the Vatican. And so my entire existence, all the opportunities I've had to rethink things, to come up with the understandings of things that, 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 that other art historians 100 years before me did not have the opportunity are thanks to the work of the patrons. And in this particular case, the cleaning of this painting makes it evident that Raphael immediately turned around and showed in the second room, what a Catholic, by the way, meaning the world universal, what a painter. So he can, yeah, I can do Michelangelo. And yes, I can invent a new technique with light and dark. And oh, by the way, if you'd like, I can do a little Venetian painting for you. And so if you look at the way the colors, now that he knows how to blend them and soften them, look at the yellow, that, that cornflower yellow on that woman's dress, which flows so softly versus the Heliodorus yellow, which is that much more metallic, stony, harder kind of color. And he has all of this range at his fingertips. Raphael is growing by leaps and bounds in what he is able to do artistically. And then, as all good things must come to an end, the final row, the final wall was due. What happened in the uh, construction of the final wall, you'll see the date here is 1514, is that in 1513, Julius II died. So this patron that had been so wonderful to Raphael died, but the new patron, Leo X, will be even greater. And as a matter of fact, in our next lecture, we're going to talk about how Raphael becomes truly the superstar painter of Rome under Leo X's reign. But Leo X wants him to work on other projects. So Raphael initially left the painting of the Attila the Hun being uh, repelled by uh, Peter and Paul and Pope Leo the Great to his assistants. But then Leo asked for Raphael to come back and add his own personal touches to it in order to keep the painting on par with the other paintings in the room. And interestingly, interestingly what Raphael added were the horsemen on the right. And as you will hear in our uh, lecture on the elusive Leonardo, Way back in 1504, when Raphael was a boy in Florence, there was a projected contest between Michelangelo and Leonardo. The true 
Clash of the Titans was supposed to happen in Florence under Leonardo and Michelangelo. And Leonardo had started work on the painting you see below. This is a copy of his preparatory drawing of the Battle of Anghiari, where Leonardo was going to show himself a master of composition and a master of horse painting. Michelangelo was doing another image. It was called the Battle of Cascina and involved a group of men who had been swimming when the attack sounded. So Michelangelo was going to show off his incredible command of the human body, its positions, its anatomy, its expressive possibilities. And the two were going to be on opposite walls. Raphael took the place of Leonardo in the Vatican. The competition was never complete in Florence. Julius II restaged it in Rome. Raphael standing in for Leonardo da Vinci. And so those two horses, I am convinced that those two horses on the right are a way of recalling or a way for Raphael taking the mantle of Leonardo da Vinci, who in 1514 had just showed up in Rome, taking the mantle of Leonardo da Vinci as the great defender of painting. But things are going to change for Raphael because again, we have a new Pope in town. And so Giovanni de' Medici, who would be, who would be, would be named, take the name of Leo X, would now be calling the shots and shaping Raphael's career. And a funny little ironic aspect, uh, Giovanni de' Medici was already a very close member of Julius II's court. So when this painting was begun in 1513, the Pope was supposed to be Julius. And here is Giovanni de' Medici as a cardinal standing in the back retinue. But Giovanni, when he became Pope, decided he wanted his own face in the painting, and so he's actually in the painting twice. And here we leave Raphael, Raphael, Michelangelo, who have just finished slogging it out in the Vatican complex. And we are going to talk about next week, we're going to talk about the triumphant Raphael. Raphael has held his own against the extraordinary work of Michelangelo, and he's been developing his artistic toolbox so that he will have plenty and plenty more ideas and plenty more beautiful things to create. So the next week we'll be talking about Raphael Triumphans, Raphael Moriens, uh, the last five years of Raphael's life.